the 2020 webinar series. My name is Anita Clemen and I represent the Southeast region on the NILG board. We'd like to share a few housekeeping items before we get started. The session is being recorded. A copy of the presentation is attached to the webinar and available for download. A transcript is also be, being made available. And you should have received a link to closed captioning. If you have a question, please use the chat functionality. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. The support they've shown us these past few months has been amazing and is greatly appreciated. Thank you to the sponsors you see on the screen for supporting the NILG and the 2020 webinar series. I'd like to introduce David Cohen. He's the president of DCI Consulting Group Incorporated and co-founder of the Institute for Workplace Equality. He provides consulting services to employers and management law firms on a wide range of human resource risk management strategies particularly in the areas of EEO affirmative action program development, systemic compensation, statistical analysis, comprehensive HR, self audits, and employee selection and test validation. Patricia Davidson, or Patty Davidson, has been a part of the Department of Labor since 1987, when she began her federal career as an investigator for the Wage and Hour Division. In February 2020, Patty joined the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs as the Deputy Director. Robert Lajunes, Bob, is Director of Enforcement for the Office of Federal Contract Compliance. He oversees the OFCCP's Statistical and Economic Analysis Program and serves as the agency's expert technical advisor in the development and resolution of systemic discrimination cases. Thank, please join me in thanking all of our speakers today, and we welcome you. Thank you, Anita. This is Patty Davidson. Um, thank you to Anita and the NILG uh, for allowing for for the, that nice introduction, Anita, and the NILG for hosting us today and allowing us to make the presentation. The slide that you see on the screen uh, in front of you is our, our disclaimer. Um, nothing that we uh, say in this presentation today is intended to be uh, for any other purposes other than, other than providing clarity about the existing requirements under law or agency policies. We have a lot, lot to cover, um, and we hope to get through as much of it as quickly as we can so that we leave time for questions and answers at the end of the hour. Um, but we're going to, as you can see from the slide, we're going to cover updates, statistics, significant cases, our er early resolution compliance agreements, mediation, conciliation, and efficiency directives. We'll talk a little bit about focused reviews. And at the end, we'll give you an update on enforcement for the rest of this fiscal year 2020 and into 2021. And now I'd like to turn it over to David Cohen. Thanks so much, Patty. And uh, hi, everybody. So great to, to be with you all. I was saying before the call that um, this is my 22nd uh, NILG conference in a row. Um, and uh, I, I've probably pre been presenting at the conference for about 18 years. And I have to say this is the first time that I've uh, presented in shorts and no shoes. So I kind of like this. So, so Tony, I know your, your role at uh, NILG, maybe we can make this a, a permanent thing um, of, of shorts and no shoes. It's kind of fun. But uh, all kidding aside, good to be with Patty and Bob. Uh, we put a lot of work into this this update and a lot of interesting stuff going on and um, uh, uh, hope, hope to get through as much uh, of, of the information as, as possible. Um, next slide. So I've been doing this OFCCP update, uh, I think at the NLG conference since at least a decade now. Um, and, and OFCCP has certainly made it easier to get access to information. And, and I, I give the agency a lot of credit 
um, in, in order for, for me to do this uh, presentation, historically, I would have to go through an entire FOIA request, Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act request, to each region um, and to get a copy of the conciliation agreements. As you know now, uh, uh, for better or for worse, the agency publishes all conciliation agreements on the website. And um, there is a natural lag. So one of the things I, I will say is that, uh, uh, you know, we were making real-time adjustments to this presentation uh, because settlements are coming in. Um, so what, what we're going to do is, on the slides, I'll, I'll give you kind of, as of, you know, last week, uh, what the settlement tally was, but even between last week and today, there there have been some significant uh, settlements, uh, and those have not been posted on uh, OFCCP's website. Um, but at, uh, on OFCCP's website, there are 24 financial agreements and 54 technical violations. So, so the differentiation between those two financial settlement is there's a finding of discrimination. A, a compliance evaluation where there are technical violations, you know, failure to list your jobs with the state or, or record keeping, uh, those get uh, categorized as technical agreements. So I use that data source as well as the, the Department of Labor's public enforcement database, and any of you can get access to that data. Uh, one caveat, when you see my presentation, you're gonna say some of the numbers don't match. That's correct. Um, uh, just using the data that's out there, uh, there are differences between the OFCCP's website and the DOL uh, enforcement database. So, so just uh, having that understanding. So let's get into the statistics uh, of OFCCP's compliance evaluations. If we go to the next slide, make sure you can go to Tony. Uh, one more. And so this is this is a chart that I've been compiling since 2004. And so let me quickly explain uh, how to read this chart. And so these are OFCCP's fiscal year, uh, which ends September 30, starts at October 1. And if you scroll all the way to the right, that shows you the number of compliance evaluations that have closed during the year. Not initiated, not that are still open, but closed. Uh, with compliance evaluations, this also includes compliance checks. So most of you know that this year the compliance check is back. Uh, so that will be included in that number. And uh, so that's the total number of reviews that have closed. If you go to the left-hand side, letter of compliance, you will see of those audits that were initiated by the agency and closed, how many of them close with a letter of compliance? So no finding of discrimination, no technical findings. Then we have consent decrees, which would be cases that have been litigated and uh, an ALJ ruling uh, or a some sort of settlement. Um, and then we have the, the financial remedies. Um, which are uh, uh, the last column. Actually, let me let me take a step back. The non-financial remedies are the technical violation. So you've got compliance, litigation, and and some sort of resolution, technical violation, and then the financial remedy. So let's just go to 2020. And what you know, one of the challenges with doing this presentation is that you know we're not done with the fiscal year. So it's mid-August right now. OFCCP uh, tends to settle a lot of click cases and close a lot of cases between now and the end of September. So this is kind of, uh, uh, will change, you know, probably in six to eight weeks, you're going to see a, a drastic change in some of these numbers. But what we see here is that OFCCP closed 1,159 reviews. So that's certainly less than, uh, I think, what the agency was, was anticipating. Um, and certainly a, a continued kind of decrease uh, over the years. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, Bush administration uh, really was kind of ripping through compliance evaluations, doing about 4,000 a year. You can see those numbers. And what you see, though, is, is a, a big decrease from the Bush administration to the uh, uh, Obama administration. And... Uh, Part of that was the Active Case Enforcement Directive. And what you see there 
is that those cases were taking longer. Um, what we know now is that the, the OFCCP kind of uh, uh, is moving off of the active case enforcement directive, uh, more towards kind of a case management, moving through an audit unless there's a problem. We're going to start to see these numbers go back up again. And I think um, Patty is going to talk about the, the efficiency in audits, the age cases, and the, the, the statistics are really staggering um, in terms of how long it's taking OFCCP to start the desk audit and close it. The numbers are down significantly. So I don't think these charts represent that, and there's a natural lag. I think we're going to start to see is that OFCCP's numbers are going to start to go up in terms of the number of reviews. Um, the, the other thing I want to point out is the non-financial. So th this is interesting in that in 2012, almost 30% of all audits, the OFCCP found some sort of violation, not discrimination, but violation. In 2020, that number is now at a little over 5%. Um, so, so what we're, we're finding is, just like I think the, the, the intent of the agency, is to move through an audit and unless there are, are, are gross violations, I mean, certainly the agency is still focusing on systemic discrimination. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, but what we're seeing is unless there are gross violations, they're working with the, the, the contractor to resolve them. That's part of their directive. Uh, and, and to move on and close the review. So I think that trend will continue. Certainly, if there's a change in administration, um, we may see a, a, a shift, but, but uh, TBD on that. So, so once again, uh, in terms of financial remedies, uh, you'll see here 32. Let's go to the next slide. You'll see that it, 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 it doesn't match here on the next slide. But what I wanted to do is, this was as of kind of last week, there were 24 conciliation agreements posted on OFCCP's uh, website. And um, uh, I know that that's changed. Uh, Bob, and, Bob and I were talking uh, in real time over the last couple of days. That number is now 30, 33, uh, uh, if, if my numbers are correct. And more importantly, um, I think OFCCP's uh, settlement amounts are probably now closer to $30 million. Bob's going to talk about uh, a settlement, uh, I think as of yesterday, that was significant. Um, but, but OFCCP is probably going to settle in north of $30 million this year in terms of total settlements. But my chart here, like I said, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is all happening in real time, uh, 24 cases. Uh, actually, it's, like I said, 32 as of today, uh, closer to $30 million in settlements. But of the 24 that I did categorize, I wanted to give a breakdown of the type of settlement. Um, and, and, and here's the thing, you know, OFCCP historically, uh, their bread and butter was hiring cases. And that continues to be the case. But as we see here, compensation, no surprise, continues to be a focus. Uh, so we had 17 hiring cases, which uh, uh, resulted in about $10 million in back pay and interest, four comp cases, $6 million in back pay and interest, uh, and uh, one case had a, uh, two cases has a comp and hiring component for $574,000. And there was one case with uh, a failure to provide an accommodation to a disabled veteran. Uh, a small case for fifteen hundred dollars. Um, I, I looked a little more closely because I wanted to say, okay, what are the cases? Is it mostly sex discrimination? Is it race ethnicity discrimination? And some, once again, there's overlap. So a case could be sex and race ethnicity. But out of my out of my twenty four cases that I have here on on the screen, fifteen out of the twenty four for involve a finding or an allegation of discrimination based on sex. Um, interestingly enough, a couple of the cases were discrimination against men, uh, and about two cases were discrimination against whites. 
Um, so I think, you know, what we're going to see at the end of the fiscal year is that the numbers in terms of settlement dollars uh, are, are going to be very close to last year, maybe falling short, but OFCCP is on uh, uh, target for, for another record and banner year. And so let's go to the, the next slide. How does that compare uh, historically? Um, you know, w once again, I've been doing this for, for a long time, uh, and I've been building this database since 2007. And what's interesting is, you know, over time, OFCCP has shifted really from a majority of the focus on affirmative action to now a, an emphasis not only on affirmative action, but on systemic discrimination. And not only just systemic discrimination as it relates to hiring, but also compensation. Now, let me pause for a second and say compensation pay equity reviews take the agency a lot longer and are a lot more complicated, which is why the agency has built out uh, the Bureau of Expert Services um, uh, uh, that, that has a group of labor economists and statisticians to do these robust statistical models. This stuff is complicated. Uh, the agency is committed to it. Uh, but what you'll see is because these cases are moving towards bigger, more systemic cases, they're covering more employees, um, and the total settlement dollars are, are, are growing. As part of this, Bob's going to talk a little bit later on, a lot of these settlements include these IRCA agreements, these early resolution compliance agree, uh, conciliation agreements that are broader than just an establishment. Um, and so the OFCCP is looking to say, okay, we're, we're finding an issue, if you will. Um, we're not only looking for you to resolve this issue at this location, we want to broaden this to all locations or a division or, or some other subset. And not only are you going to do back pay and interest, but we want you to make changes to your policies, procedures, your practices, what have you. Um, and I think that's smart, right? I mean, I think the agency is looking to say, let's resolve the issue, but let's also figure out what's driving that issue, get ahead of it, uh, and, and have a contractor fix that. The one thing I will, I will mention about the chart here and the chart before, you will notice that the cases are still hiring and compensation. Um, and I've been tracking this to, since 2007, and although the agency does investigate termination issues and promotion issues, in terms of findings, there are very few systemic findings uh, in the last 13 years uh, that are promotion or termination cases. Now, stay tuned, right? The agency is looking to kind of change the way it evaluates promotions, change the way it does the promotions analyses. I think one of the things the agency is figuring out is that there really are two types of promotions, competitive promotions, natural progression promotions. Um, so my prediction is that the agency, as they launch these promotion focus reviews, they're going, they're going to look at glass ceiling issues, uh, they're going to look at promotion practices, and we may start to see that, you know, yes, it's hiring, yes, it's compensation, but as part of even these compensation cases, there are promotion issues. So, so my advice, advice to, to folks on the call, um, start thinking about, if you haven't already, uh, evaluating your promotion practices, because that is the direction that the agency is certainly going in. So, right, last year, best record, uh, 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 best in terms of year for OFCCP on record total settlement dollars. This year, um, I think they're going to come in close. Remember, the, these numbers are moving. Right now, they're, they're about 25 uh, million, potentially up to, to 30 million. Um, and we've got uh, uh, over a month to go before the end of the fiscal year. So, one of the things I wanted to do, because my my uh, theory was 
uh, the, the cases were changing. And, and in my experience, the cases were getting larger, you know, more complex and more in, uh, uh, systemic in nature. Uh, so not only, right, did the case numbers go up uh, in terms of total settlement dollars, what I wanted to look at is the average settlement per case. So if we can go to the next slide. So this is fascinating. Um, look at this chart. So in 2007, the average conciliation agreement between a contractor and OFCCP for a finding of discrimination was $200,000. The average settlement in 2019 was $900,000. And if you look at the chart in 2020, you know, we don't have the final numbers, but looking at what I think some of the settlements, I think that the average is going to be pretty darn close. So what does that tell you? What that tells you is not only is OFCCP settlement dollars going up, but the cases are becoming more systemic in nature, uh, meaning they're, they're looking at uh, uh, broader policies and procedures as it relates to hiring or compensation. And right in 2019, if you settled with OFCCP for a conciliation agreement, on average, it was $900,000 versus in 2007 or even in 2015, it was uh, $200,000. Um, so a lot more liability. It, it, it's certainly showing that the agency is going to more systemic cases, and I think that uh, we will continue to see that. Next slide. And Bob and Patty, uh, by all means, chime in at, at any point. So the other thing I, I wanted to look at um, of the non-discrimination findings, right, uh, as of this week, there were 54 conciliation agreements posted on OSCCP's website. And so I wanted to see, okay, what were the types of violations? So remember, when we talk about technical violations, um, the, the, the agency conducted a compliance evaluation, and they're saying, we don't think you engaged in systemic discrimination, but you do have some deficiencies in your program. Um, so actually, if you go to the next uh, chart, what I did was just kind of uh, tallied up the violations. Now, now you'll note that these uh, uh, exceed the 54 um, because a lot of these agreements had multiple violations. Um, but if you look at the top three, and, and I will tell you, this hasn't changed. Um, I've been tracking this since 2007, uh, like I said, and the top three violations continue to be failure to engage in outreach and recruitment, so good faith efforts, and whether that be for individuals that, with disabilities, protected veterans, or minorities and females, record keeping, uh, 23, uh, and then a failure to list jobs with the state employment office. Remember, that requirement uh, falls under VEVRA. Um, so if you're, if, you're, if you're looking, you know, to see uh, what are the, 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 the top three violations, the, the, there you go. And then uh, the next one down is, is not really having a compliant AAP and then a failure to conduct uh, adverse impact analyses. So that kind of gives you a summary of the uh, non-financial violations. Okay, next slide. Moving on to the um, uh, 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 administrative complaints. So let me let me talk about this for a second and kind of set this slide up, right? So if you're not familiar with OFCCP's enforcement process, right? So you get, you get uh, scheduled for a compliance evaluation. You have that evaluation and hopefully, right, at the end of the evaluation, you know, hopefully within a couple months, I mean, I know certainly that's uh, 
uh, the goal uh, uh, of, of Director Lean is to kind of move through these audits if there are no problems. But at the end of the, the review, OFCCP can close the case, or if they think there's some sort of violation, uh, they can issue a notice of violation and conciliation agreement. Uh, if the matter involves uh, alleged discrimination, there's a step in between called a predetermination notice. But either way, you know, if you end up with a notice of violation, OFCCP will propose a conciliation agreement. And at that point, right, you go into conciliation. And at, at some point, right, the, 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 a, a contractor can either decide to conciliate and settle the matter. Um, if not, and, and the case uh, conciliation stalls, the agency could issue what's called a show cause notice to say, hey, tell us within 30 days why we shouldn't take this case hand it over to our lawyers, and our lawyers could potentially file a complaint against you. And at that point, it becomes what's called an administrative complaint, and you've got uh, litigation. So you're involved in litigation. And I've kind of bucketed the litigation and the administrative complaint into two buckets. One, right, the allegation and the case involves uh, uh, discrimination. Or two, it's what we call a denial access uh, kind, kind of case. So uh, I don't think I'm a contractor. I'm not going to turn over my plan because I'm not a contractor. An OFCCP says you are a contractor. Well, a judge is going to decide that. Or I'm involved in a matter and OFCCP wants lots of records and I say we're not willing to turn over those records. The agency may file a denial of access case. Um, so two types of cases. So look at 2015, 11 cases filed, 9, 11, and starting in 2018, 1, 2019, 2, and 2020, 0. So, so far in fiscal year 2020, no administrative complaints have been filed uh, by the agency. Um, I think part of that is, look, litigation is really not good for anybody. It's not good for OFCCP. It's not good for contractors. It takes a long time. Litigation is a very drawn out process. So one of the goals, and like I said, Bob's going to talk about it, and, and certainly it's one of the goals of, of Director Lean is to go to contractors and say, let's get into this IRCA early resolution. We'll give in a little, you give in a little, but let's come up with a resolution that's in the best interest of all of us. Um, so I think that could be one of the reasons why uh, we, we see a significant decrease, and, and so far this year, zero uh, administrative complaints. Um, so we saw a lot at the end of the Obama administration. Some of the litigation, we, we, you know, it was called the midnight litigation right before a change of administration. Litigation was filed. But now we've seen a kind of a cool down uh, on litigation. Next slide. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob to talk about some significant conciliation agreements. Yes, thank and you, David. This, this, and oh, sorry, this is Kevin. I just wanted to interject maybe before we segue. Uh, there were two questions that came in for, for David's uh, portion. So do you want to wait until the end or uh, we can do it now? I just figured we, you know, I might wouldn't cover uh, go. Oh, let's, let's hold them. I may cover some of them. Yeah, okay. let's hold them. All right. Um, okay. Yeah. So thank you, Dave. Thank you for all the participants to for connecting today. Uh, I think this third time I might address the group, and you'll be glad to hear it's my last time for this year, anyway. I'm looking forward to that, Bill. Uh, some of the trends that are certainly driven by the early resolution procedures. Um, those tend to be larger cases. They also involve multi-establishment. So, you know, we're going to result in having large settlements 
And then, you know, if you're looking at the average per settlement, that's going to tend to be high because in many cases, like the first one shown here, if you can advance the slide, uh, those involve a dozen establishments. I think this one was this one between 9 and 11. Hog off the presses from Monday. The agency signed a conciliation, of, that's a global conciliation agreement with Wells Fargo for seven. Point eight million dollars to resolve um, hiring discrimination findings uh, involving 3,400 class members, and Wells Fargo has agreed to extend 580 job offers uh, that involved evaluations in the Swarm region, our Southeast region, and our Midwest. Um, you know, it's evaluations with different findings at different times. Um, sometimes there weren't findings, other cases there were, but that's the approach that we, or the flexibility we have with an IRCA is try to resolve uh, any issues and a variety of issues um, across multiple establishments. Uh, this um, particular agreement involves 42 FAPs that will be monitored uh, nationwide, and in addition, uh, this is a, an edit, I think, from the PowerPoint that was distributed. There will also be monitoring of the non-FAP employees, so it may cover close to 112,000 employees uh, in the end. So, uh, you know, we're thankful um, that Wells Fargo will be monitoring and implementing those hiring and compensation practices. Uh, early in the year, I think it was technically September 30th or October 1st, we signed an agreement with Cisco. Um, so as you can see, I guess the theme of this slide is that we, we have big settlements, we have small settlements, we have um, a variety of industries. We, we've had good buy-in and collaboration with the financial industry and the IT industry. And we're looking to expand this to other industries, consulting industries, for example, or other service industries. Um, so you can see there's the Cisco agreement that we signed that was compensation. The one, uh, you know, real benefit to that was a minimum allocation of a half million a year towards pay adjustments and more if needed. Um, just to remind people that we also uh, review public utilities, and so we signed an IRCA with the Northern Indian, uh, Indiana Public Service Corporation, and then more recently with Shamrock Foods. So you can see there's a variety of industries that this has worked for. Um, I'll speak more about the pros and cons of the IRCAs um, or the IRP program, but We've been quite pleased with the, um, you know, the variety of establishments and reviews that we've been able to resolve. And I think it's, you know, it's, it, obviously it's driven our discrimination finding rate and it's led to um, record breaking um, financial recoveries. And I do think that we will be, uh, we'll definitely be north of 30 million this year, probably pretty close to 35 million just based on some of the things that are being negotiated right now. Um, so next slide, and I think that's that goes hey, back if, to you, David. Yeah, what, one point I would make though, Bob, to, uh, you know, for example, on the Cisco uh, concili, uh, IRCA, you know, and, and you know, look, that's one of the pros of the IRCA, right? And we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but the, um, uh, you know, Cisco had, uh, K, uh, compliance evaluations that were pending, in process, and as part of the IRCA agreement, um, all of those were closed. Um, so, th so that is, a, you know, a, a big pro to to an IRCA. You know, this was this was a, a compliance evaluation at at a location, but as part of the IRCA agreement, uh, above and beyond what what Bob mentioned, uh, pending audits, current audits, you know, everything kind of got wrapped up into one IRCA agreement. And, 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 you know, one of the, we'll talk later on, but remember w with an IRCA agreement, no new audits for, for five years. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more. But I mean, what, what you see here is once again, you know, a mix of comp cases and hiring cases 
Um, but these are these are substantial cases in terms of uh, dollar amounts, um, you know, for both hiring and compensation. Next slide. So the ne the next kind of case we'll we'll talk about, um, and I believe this was covered in another presentation. But if you if you you didn't catch the the presentation, I think Mickey covered this. Um, it really is a fascinating uh, conciliation agreement and and really you know when I first started doing this work we, we really you never saw OFCCP pursue uh, or very rarely pursue a case where whites and or males were victims of discrimination um, and to OFCCP's credit right they're, they're saying look we're, we're, we're uh, an agency uh, as part of our charter, we ensure non-discrimination against every protected group. And remember, whites and males are a federally protected group. Um, so, so in, in this emphasis agreement uh, and review, OFCCP alleged that emphasis discriminated against white applicants in favor of Asian applicants, particularly Asian Indians. Uh, for a computer systems analyst position. So we've seen these types of cases before. Um, you know, OFCCP found that only 9% of the hires were white and 89% were Asian uh, and Asian Indians were over 90% of the Asian hires. Uh, and uh, emphasis paid $171,000 as part of this agreement. So nothing stood out as part of that agreement. We, we've seen these types of agreements before. But if you go to the next slide, what was fascinating about this agreement, and, and full disclosure, we, we've had lots of conversations with the agency about this, uh, and the Institute for Workplace Equality, I believe NILG, uh, have put in uh, letters to the agency asking for clarification on this uh, conciliation agreement, and why. Well, one of the things in the conciliation agreement, and let me take a step back. Certainly, if the agency does an investigation and finds discrimination against whites, part of the remedy will be ensuring that the company is not discriminating against whites. But what was fascinating about this agreement is OFCCP, as, as part of the agreement, cited emphasis for not establishing affirmative action goals for whites and or men on the front end. That is very different. Um, and remember, the affirmative action regulations um, do not cover whites and men. The non-discrimination part of the regulation uh, certainly covers whites and men, but the intent of the executive order and standard practice and what's in the regulation, we do not set up goals for whites and men. And I've had lots of calls with, with, with clients who said, wait a second, I read this agreement. Is this saying that I should be doing a utilization analysis proactively for whites and men? My answer is no. Because remember, affirmative action is about targeted outreach and recruitment to underrepresented groups. And if you're, if we're now saying that we're going to have affirmative action for all groups, well, really, then what's the purpose of affirmative action? So my advice is I think this was an error by the agency, um, and I do not think it's the intent of the agency that contractors are, are proactively setting goals for whites and men. Now, once again, in the event of a finding of discrimination, that could certainly be a part of the remedy, and that makes good sense. I just wanted to next slide give some context behind it to kind of back up what what, I, what i'm talking about is the regulations right talk about uh uh setting goals for minorities uh and and, and women now there is a clause it's interesting and and you know um, if we remember the proposed scheduling letter talked about potentially requiring contractors to set goals uh, for men or women of a particular minority group. But the regulations, once again, it says in the event of a substantial disparity, 
that may be a requirement. OFCCD ultimately dropped that from the uh, the scheduling letter, um, and I think that makes sense because it, it just gets confusing. But as a side note to this, folks, I think one thing to 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 note is intersectionality discrimination is something that I know employers are starting to think about and starting to to test. That is not necessarily what's required under the regulations, but intersectionality discrimination is something I think we may, we may see the agency go to, uh, and certainly something that employers may want to explore under a DNI context. But as far as the regulations, uh, certainly I don't think that that is required. And just next slide. Um, the regulations, once again, kind of, uh, uh, and the Federal Contract Compliance Manual define what a minority is. And what you'll notice there is that whites are not included uh, as part of a minority group. Uh, now, certainly, situation specific, if you, if you handed me a, a, a data set of an employer and said, could whites be a minority? Of course, they could be a minority of that data set, but legally, Right. And, and from a regulatory standpoint, whites, uh, the, the intent was not to include them for the affirmative action plan um, and not to proactively set goals. So I think my takeaway to, to out of all this, because I know there's been a ton of talk about it. Uh, I know NILG had concerns about it, is I think this is a one off. It, it should be only used in the event of a remedy when there's a finding discrimination. And employers should not be setting goals and utilization analyses for, for whites and men. Bob, Patty, any thoughts? This is Bob Lajeunesse. I'll just say that the agency's answer to the question posed by David's client is the same, that we're not with this conciliation agreement trying to redefine affirmative action. Uh, however, if you had a similar fact pattern, um, we think you should start addressing it and engaging in outreach and the like. And so the, um, you know, the remedy, the non-discrimination component is very important. So if we pivot away from the affirmative action to the non-discrimination, and David did mention that we've had conciliation agreements for, for whites, for white men, we've actually had uh, an enforcement ruling. Uh, related to that. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the regulations are rather prescient in that definition of non-discrimination because that has led to the permacy of our, our agency and the mission. Um, that universality that's built into the non-discrimination component provides buy-in for multiple groups, the same way that FDR social security system or social security act was universal and has been, you know, uh, embraced by all members of society and people who propose, you know, public higher education also make the same argument for universality. So it is important. And director Wayne realizes that it's important that we protect neutrality for all groups and so that's what we're trying to do not necessarily redefine affirmative action thanks bob so, uh, and that's actually a great a great tie into the most one of the most recent alj orders on wms solutions right bob you want to talk about that um well maybe we both can uh again that yeah. dealt with the favored favored hiring for um, you know Hispanic men. Um, can you go to the next slide where we are talking about WMS, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, favored um, hot, uh, group of Hispanic men um, resulted in shortfalls um, across multiple groups, and then furthermore um, discrimination in um, access to hours and pay for female workers and then also there were some race issues with the, the compensation as well and then uh, unfortunately the hispanics that were hired faced a 
uh, intimidating and, and coercive workforce. Um, so there was an injunction against that. And David, I'll let you speak to the last point there, because um, that was an interesting uh, part of the order. Yeah, and, and I hate to criticize an ALJ, but I think this ALJ got this wrong. Uh, and, and one point about this, right? These, these are ALJ rulings. Uh, ALJ means an administrative law judge. Um, so this is not federal court. This is a, this is a labor department judge. And these are just recommended orders. Um, so this does not set agency policy. Um, it really is just a, for a matter as it relates to this case. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about the, the ruling, how the judge interpreted the, and let me take a step back. One of the allegations by OFCCP is that WMS didn't have the appropriate record to conduct a meaningful analysis on applicants. So they had to use census and other data uh, to kind of do some sort of, uh, of evaluation. Um, and so one of the, the allegations was that, that WMS did not keep records in accordance with the regulations. And I'm going to read to you what the judge ruled uh, that is that it's fascinating, uh, his interpretation. And, and so this is the judge said, the regulations imposes an obligation on a cover contractor to preserve personnel employment records that are made or kept, quote unquote. The regulations do not impose an affirmative obligation on cover contractors to create personnel and employment records. Um, and so, so what he, he basically concluded is, well, yeah, they didn't keep records on all applicants and job seekers uh, and race and sex on, on all job seekers, um, but they didn't create a record of those individuals. So if they didn't create the record, there's no obligation under the regulations to then create the record. Um, I think that's wrong. I think if you look at the regulations, it's pretty clear that there's a record keeping obligation, not only to keep it if it exists, uh, but to, for example, track all job seekers. I mean, the internet applicant regulations specifically talk about the records that might must be maintained. Um, so I wouldn't hang my hat on that ruling to say, oh, you know what? The judge made it clear. I only have to keep the records that are created. I'm just not going to create any records. Uh, first of all, I don't think that's going to work well uh, uh, for you. Um, and I just think that that's one ALJ ruling. One other comment, Bob, if I, if I could, about the compensation case. And once again, this is just an ALJ ruling. What the judge said, so OFCCP performed, and OFCCP's expert performed a regression analysis. And, and WMS said, well, wait a second, we don't think your regression analysis, first of all, is robust enough, meaning it's not accounting for the en enough variance in pay, and you're missing certain factors. And so WMS was really just criticizing OFCCP's regression model. And what this judge said, that is not enough. You must put forward your regression analysis to set, to show that that would uh, cure the alleged flaws of OFCCP's analysis. So once again, this is only just one ALJ ruling, but, but this ALJ said, you can't just criticize OFCCP's analysis. You can't just say, well, there are missing factors. The judge is saying, I want to see what your factors are and your regression model to show that the, the statistical significance is no longer significant. Um, so that was, that was this judge's interpretation of Title VII requirements. Um, and and I, I found that interesting. Yeah, thank you, David. The, the reason I asked you to speak to some of that is because this case is still under exception, so we, we can't say much about it until uh, the things <laughs> finalized. But there have been two other orders recently from ALJ that are noteworthy in their pattern. 
uh, they didn't make the slide here, but in JPMC, we received an order that has led to uh, expansion of scope and discovery. And the same thing with Potomac abatement after about a six year uh, waiting period. Uh, so both of those have reinforced uh, our ability to expand the temporal scope of our cases in enforcement. I just think that that's noteworthy. Um, as David said, sometimes these are just one rulings, but when you see a pattern of that happening, um, then you, you really need to take notice. Okay, thanks. So what's and I, next? And I, I don't like that pattern, Bob. I just want to say that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, why don't you talk to us about IRCAs? IRCAs, great. Um, so I gave you a little bit of preview. We have signed 21, go ahead to the next slide. We've signed 21 IRCAs since the inception of the program uh, back in 2018. So it's a good two year check in point. Uh, we secured pretty close to $40 million in back pay. And as I mentioned, in, in one instance, there, uh, there are salary adjustments. Um, so that's uh, actually the case in a few others as well. So um, at a minimum of five million in salary adjustments over the next five years, uh, we you know hope there will be more if needed, and we'll be looking for that in the, the monitoring and, and reporting um, that will cover uh, north of 400,000 employees. And I expect this um, tally of IRCAs to approach 30 by the end of the, I'm hopeful, you know, that it will approach 30 by the end of this year. And at that point, we may have six or 700,000 um, employees under monitoring and reporting. Uh, so that's good. That allows us to take, um, you know, cert certain contractors off the scheduling list and for us to, you know, focus on others who might be ignoring EEO obligations or violating them. So um, we think it's a, a plus in terms of our scheduling, in terms of our operations, and uh, benefit for the companies as well, um, because they're getting um, their exemption period as well as expanding the coverage to uh, all the employees that need to be uh, examined. Uh, and it may help them satisfy, you know, equity in other areas. Uh, I did put together a list. Uh, this was the most recent list I have, and the next page is the hiring. Um, oh, sorry, the first is the compensation. Um, so you can get a, a feel for where the compensation discriminations are falling. You can see there, there's another public utility, Dominion Power. Um, and then a lot of IT and finance uh, individuals and one uh, university has recently been added this year to the compensation uh, grid here for the ERCAs. And then next slide is the, the hiring. Um, you know, as David said, it's still the majority, but only slightly. So, um, you know, we've been using these ERCAs to address the comp hiring, sometimes both. Um, and then even steering, which, you know, there, I guess there's some debate whether that's a compensation issue or a selection issue. I have it listed here as, as a hiring, um, but it could go under comp as well, I guess. So, um, yeah, so there you have it. Those are the 21. Um, and, you know, I, we're hoping to sign more. Um, we. I think it's a positive program. Um, we've been able to address some age cases. To David's point earlier, not every establishment is at the same stage. And so some of them, you know, for example, with um, Wells Fargo, there were two that were recently opened and others that dated back to 2010. Um, but the IRCA allows us to uh, resolve all of those together close them out and close any pending um, reviews that are on the scheduling list. Um, so it's been very helpful in, in wrapping up, um, you know, a series of, of the establishments that are open and admittedly some of them have been lingering. Uh, and so it's been very useful in reducing our age case uh, load. So David, do you want to talk more about uh, pros and cons of 
Erica, is that our next slide? Yeah, let, let's go to the next slide. So, and so from my perspective, right, and, and, and I've worked on quite a few of these IRCA agreements um, and worked closely with Bob on these IRCA agreements. So, so I, I'm very familiar with the program and, and how it works. Um, and certainly I've counseled some of my clients to, to do an IRCA and, some, and, 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 and sometimes it just, it makes really good sense, right? I mean, you look, one of the things that's problematic about OFCCP compliance evaluations is it, it, it starts with the selection system. And I think the agency will be the first to tell you that, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to figure out a list and to try and target contractors that are most likely out of compliance. Um, and, and so what we've seen, right, through the years is, is that prime contractors, not subcontractors, but prime, you know, they get picked for an audit and they get a letter of compliance and then they get audited over and over and over again, 20, 30 a year, just to find that they're in compliance. And I think the agency would be the first to say, yeah, that's just not efficient. Um, so the IRCA, right, allows the agency to say, we're going to just treat you as a contractor or, or some sort of subset of, of that, like let's say a division, um, and we're going to wrap you in this program and not launch establishment reviews um, over and over again for the next five years. So there's, there's certainly a pro to that. Um, and once again, with these IRCA agreements, um, it's an early resolution, so the idea is you enter into it sooner rather than later, it allows the agency a lot more flexibility in terms of how they're gonna position the audit. It certainly helps in terms of the press release because the agency has, has probably a little bit more flexibility uh, on that press release. And the big pro is that no new audits for five years, but don't forget everybody, at the end, of the five-year period because you're going to be reporting so technically you're still under review you get two years on the back end the moratorium once once uh, that five-year period is up so really from the signing of the audit to to uh, uh you will not have a new establishment review of those covered under the IRCA for seven years um and 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 that's that's a nice thing it's it's in, in terms of Managing your resources, um, audits are a huge drain on uh, on contractors. Um, so I think that 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 that's certainly the upside. Um, the other thing, you know, it allows you to kind of look more broadly and allows you uh, your your internal resources to say, okay, you know, what's the allegation that OSCCB is making? Let's try to address that, fix that. We'll we'll work with the agency, so so they'll you know review that. And then, uh, in theory, right, that shouldn't be an issue going forward. Sounds great. Here's my concern, right? We're, we're in an election year. And technically, you're under audit because you're going to be reporting during the five-year period. So, you know, under the current administration and, and Director Lean, I think that there's this partnership. But what happens if there's a change administration and a new administration came, comes in and says, you know what, I don't like these IRCA programs and I want to go back in. Um, and, and there's really nothing uh, in a lot of these agreements that prevents OFCCB from coming back in again um, and launching a, a full investigation. So that, that's a concern. Certainly we have not seen that. I think certainly um, you know, if, if Craig Lean stays at OFCCP um, uh, 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 for the next four years, uh, that won't happen. But we're in an election year and, and anything can happen. So I think you need to be uh, aware of that. Uh, think about what you're going to be reporting. Think about what's going to allow OFCCP to come back in. David, this is Bob. That's can my I thoughts. Respond to that? um, can you probably of course in the negotiation of some of these um <laughs> you know i certain that if 
if there was a change in the, the you know directorship or administration, you know, I would try to prevail that there are better uses of the agency's resources than going in and re you know reexamining some of these workers. I mean, we're already getting something. We're getting some reporting. We yep. think that we're confident. We so that I've always approached this that we need to be confident with the model. Um, that is agreed yep. to and the approach and the scope and the scale that's agreed to. Uh, once we have that confidence, then, you know, I think it leads to permanency. And so we could, you know, make the argument and try to prevail that, um, you know, there are better ways of using the agency's resources in the future, i.e. looking at the whole universe of um, contractors that haven't been examined. Um, and, you know, in the last 10 years, for example. And so I, I think yeah. that will provide some some confidence, um, and it has, because we've, you know, we've signed yeah. quite a few of these and we continue to negotiate them. So hopefully, you know, that, that will be the case. Uh, one other thing I'd like to say is we do have a preference, or um, I have a preference anyway for the coverage to be as broad as possible because one difficulty we would have and the contractor would have to monitor is when we negotiate a subset, you know, then we have to keep track of which establishments are exempt and which aren't and to keep the, you know, the exempt establishments off the list and keep the others in the mix. And so it's just easier if you, we can exempt the whole parent company. Um, you know, so that's something to keep in mind when you're negotiating this with the agency that uh, that we prefer a larger scope to a smaller scope. That's all. Thanks. Yes. All right, Patty, I think you're up. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about conciliation and mediation. Um, I don't have a conciliation slide, so I'm just going to talk about it before we move to the mediation slide. Um, Conciliation has long been a means of resolving discrepancies between OFCCP and contractors during the enforcement process. And we've had significant success resolving findings through that conciliation process. We've talked about that uh, all the way through this presentation um, and then moving through into enforcement. But the agency still remains focused on determining how we can make this process better. And we've done that through uh, issuing a few directives. Um, in November of 2018, we issued the Early Resolution Procedures Directive, which has an acronym that I don't like to say, but it's ERP. Uh, we also issued the Efficiency and Compliance Directive in April of 2020. And OFCCP recognizes its procedural duty to conciliate with contractors prior to enforcement, which leads me to mediation and pre-referral mediation. Tony, if you could go to the next slide, please. So mediation has also long been an effective mechanism for the agency and contractors seeking to resolve large and aged cases. And given mediation su successful, given our success in OFCCP recently with mediation, we chose to identify ways that dispute resolution processes could more actively be utilized. And that led to the release of the pre-referral mediation directive in April of this year. This directive serves to establish parameters for how mediation will be arranged at OFCCP moving forward, including appropriate instances for use of mediation, who will mediate the cases, and what the coordination of mediation logistics will typically look like. All of this is available on our website. Basically, the directive announces mediation as a last attempt at obtaining timely remedies and avoiding the delay and expense of litigation. And as David and Bob have talked about in the previous hour, this has really assisted the agency to move through its age case backlog and, and reach resolution on a number of very large and significant cases. Um, we found that it's most useful after attempts to conciliate following the issu issuance of a show cause notice, citing violations of discrimination, but prior to referral for enforcement. Uh, OFCCP reserves the right to moderate, I mean, to mediate at any stage and may indeed offer mediation to contractors at other stages during the review. I think I'm kicking it back over to Bob now. The, you know, the one thing I'd say about mediation, and, and Patty and Bob 
Please and do. I were just in in one a couple of weeks ago, um, and I thought it was effective. And and I I'll tell you, you know, we we didn't think we'll we would be able to resolve the issue pre mediation. And um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, but the mediation program, at least according to FCCP, ha, has has been very successful. And every single one, am I correct, that mediations have have been resolved? I, I think we are, if we're not at 100%, we're at 99. But I believe you're correct. Yeah, so certainly some that can. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's 100%. It'd be hard to achieve 99 because it's been less than a dozen. <laughs> but uh, it could be, I suppose, 90. Uh, but I think you're right. It's 100% so far a resolution, you know. Um, I won't say success because neither side should, you know, ascribe it as, as a success or a failure, it's just a resolution, right? An effective resolution means you're somewhat happy, you're somewhat disappointed, but in the end, you feel, you know, content that, that it was resolved. And even the uh, electronic or remote mediations have been, um, <laughs> you know, far more efficient, and useful, um, and seamless than I expected. And so, David's right, we had one last week, we have another one next week, so we're continuing with the, that mediation directive. Uh, the other directive that came out recently was efficiency uh, in our audits. Uh, that's just a way for us to uh, ensure that the um, efficiencies that have been achieved under directive lean um, you know, are maintained. We don't want to go through all of this effort and work of the Improving our age caseload through ERCAs and others, uh, and then have it backslide. So, can you go to the next uh, slide, Tony? Um, so, that, that's been wonderful in terms of reducing our times of processing, um, and um, also we've greatly improved our desk audit uh, down to. 35, uh, I think I might have even heard the statistic of 32 days more recently. Um, so, yeah, we put, put together directives, certain steps that the agency will take internally to um, notify uh, the regional directors and the front office uh, when cases become delayed and an opportunity for contractors after certain waiting periods to at least uh, inquire about uh, why that case is aged and as all of you know we also have an ombuds office now that um, you know you can uh, contact to get a um, description or at least some feedback on why a case has become aged but um, we're going to do our best to keep those age cases low and keep things moving uh, into either pre-referral mediation or into to referral to litigation so that's all from from him. The the one comment I'll I'll make on this is this is certainly a welcome change. Um, you know I think one of the biggest complaints by contractors under the prior administration is that every audit under the Active Case Enforcement Directive was treated as a full blown audit. So you'd send in the desk audit materials, and then you know you'd get a 21 page request for information. Um, that would take, you know, 500 hours to 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 satisfy, um, regardless of the you know, of, of what the agency found during the the desk audit. Um, that just doesn't make sense for OFCCP. Doesn't make sense for contractors. So I think under the the new directive, um, really is, is forcing the agency to focus um, and and be much more efficient with their time and our time. And and we're seeing that in the stats with desk audits closing more quickly uh, when there are no issues. So I, I, I really think that's a, that's a welcome change uh, uh, from contractors, for, for contractors. That's actually a good segue for me, unless Bob wants to say anything else about our, our good stats. Uh, no, the, the, the conciliation is also a part of that. And so the agency offered a webinar you know, last week about how we're trying to streamline conciliation and the mediation and the ombuds work. And so it, it all uh, ties together in terms of keeping the cases moving and flowing through. So go ahead, Patty. I was going to segue into focused reviews. 
You can go to the next slide, Tony, thanks. So generally speaking, um, in August of 2008, OFCCP is issued its focused reviews directive to ensure that a portion of future scheduling lists include focused reviews under each of the three authorities that we enforce. They're one of the investiga investigatory procedures that OFCCP uses to evaluate contractors' equal employment opportunity efforts. Focused reviews are authorized in the regulations of each of the three laws that we enforce. Um, our focused reviews are conducted at the headquarters facility and include a mandatory on-site review. But because of COVID-19 um, and the restrictions of the pandemic, OFCCP is conducting virtual on-site reviews for these focused reviews. Um, with the possibility of physical on-site reviews in the future, although none of us know when that will be. So, so far, we've had great success utilizing virtual on-site focused reviews. Um, and there's some best practices that have come out of this that we may maintain uh, as an organization moving forward. OFCCP has developed an extensive guidance package that's available on our website, and I encourage all of you to visit uh, and take a look at that. In Section 503 Focused Reviews, um, as the name would indicate, we focus on the policies and practices of a contractor related solely to, the Section, 5, to Section 503 compliance. We take a closer look at the contractor's AAP that they've developed and implemented to employ and advance in employment individuals with disabilities, including outreach and recruitment efforts, applicant and hiring data analysis, and utilization goal analysis. OFCCP ensures that the contractor is not discriminating against individuals with disabilities and complying with reasonable accommodation obligations. Section 503 focused reviews are a central part of OFCCP's commitment to disability inclusion in the workplace. Under VEVRA, OFCCP started scheduling uh, focused reviews in July of this year. In a, in a VEVRA focused review, the compliance officer reviews policies and practices of a contractor related solely to the VEVR compliance. OFCCP takes a closer look at the AAP that a contractor developed and implemented regarding employing and advancing within the workplace veterans, including outreach and recruitment efforts, applicant and hiring data analysis, and annual hiring benchmark establishment. OFCCP ensures that the contractor is complying with reasonable accommodation obligations for disabled veterans and not discriminating against applicants or employees based on their status as protected veterans. Next slide, please. Some of our upcoming focused reviews will focus on accommodations and promotions. Um, under accommodations, uh, we'll kick off promotions focused, I'm sorry, We'll uh, kick off accommodations reviews in both, looking both at religious accommodations and disability accommodations. As David talked about earlier, um, regarding our promotions accommodations, uh, OSCCP is still is still reviewing uh, definitions under this program. Uh, we're working to define promotion. I'm sure people will have questions about that. We're working closely with our policy division to come up with that, with those standards. And um, as always, OFCCP will be transparent and provide information on our website and uh, provide guidance and compliance assistance uh, and be as transparent as possible. Let me go to the next slide. So a little bit about our enforcement priorities um, moving forward. Can we go to the next slide? So in terms of the remainder of this, this year, fiscal year 2020 and moving into 2021, um, under hiring and compensation, OFCCP will continue protecting all classes equally. Um, and as we talked about a little bit earlier, including white males, protecting small groups, for example, Native Americans and multi-race groups. 
Uh, we will be looking at intersectional discrimination. That's something that David uh, talked about a little bit earlier in the presentation. And this has already been cited in some of our recent notice of violations. For compensation enforcement, OFCCP will prioritize matters where there's both statistical and non-statistical evidence of discrimination. OSCCP continuously provides certainty through guidance in the form of our frequently asked questions on our website. And in the past few months, we've posted several FAQs on a variety of topics, including compensation guidance. Bob talked a lot about conciliations. We talked a little bit about the early resolution procedures, establishing a program that gives supply and service contractors an efficient way to resolve establishment-based compliance evaluations early in the life of, of a compliance evaluation. By bypassing the predetermination notice and the notice of violations and going straight to a conciliation agreement. With the commitment to implementing related corrective actions corporate-wide or for a negotiated subset, ERPS, not my favorite acronym, earn the contractor a five-year scheduling exemption. Through the Early Resolution Program, OFCCP aims to encourage and facilitate broad-based compliance before seeking inform enforcement through the legal system. Overall, this can increase OFCCP's positive impact on American workers while maintaining and possibly even reducing the burden on contractors. Um, I'm gonna finish up with terms and conditions of work. I just looked at the clock. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we will consider in our compliance evaluations, contractors, safety precautions, um, and whether they have a disparate impact on any of the protected bases. During compliance evaluations, including compliance checks, OFCCP now prioritizes accommodation requests based upon disability and religion. OFCCP reviews the contractor's disability and religious accommodations policies, all denied requests for accommodations, and whether a lack of centralized accommodation systems causes a disparate impact. Contractors should ensure that parental and family leave policies and related benefits are neutrally applied and sufficiently available to avoid a disparate impact. OFCCP revised its voluntary self-identification form, which is available on our website, for individuals with disabilities in May of this year, and it became effective in early August. During the re revision and reauthorization process, OFCCP considered the feedback it received from the contractor community. OFCCP hopes that the revised form will better help contractors in developing programs to increase the utilization of people with disabilities and thereby meeting their annual 7% aspirational goal. When a contractor finds that its applicants and employees are declining to use the self-identification form, OFCCP recommends as a best practice that they evaluate how welcoming is the environment to make it conducive to applicants and employees to reveal sensitive information. So I wanted to leave enough time for questions and answers. I know I've been monitoring the chat. I know there are a lot of questions. And um, Anthony, I don't know if you wanna facilitate that for us or how you wanna do that. Thank you, Patty. Um, oh, Anita, we thank you, Anita. Have, we do have quite a few questions and I don't know that we'll have enough time to uh, go through all of them. Um, but we do hope that we'll be able to get them to you so that the, we can share the answers with the audience. I'd like to go back to the um, technical violation slide. One of the questions was, um, what is a non-compliant AAP? And on that same slide, there was a, a question related to how is a failure to file VETS 4212 a violation? So I'll I'll start with it. I think you know when OSCCP you know uh, sends out the scheduling letter, 
right? There's the itemized listing, and the itemized listing has the job group analysis, workforce analysis, utilization goals, so on and so forth. Um, so let's just say um, you you didn't do a proper utilization analysis, or you didn't do your Vevra uh, hiring benchmark or, or your disability goals. I think the agency would say you're, you're, you submitted your plan, but it's not technically compliant. So therefore, you, you have deficiencies, probably provide compliance assistance to ensure that your plan is compliant. Um, as it relates to 4212, my understanding is the agency um, has the right to, to cite um, for, for vets um uh the the not you know not filing your vets 4212 reports bob patty hey. any thoughts yeah that that because bob that was my, so that's my understanding as well i think it's intertwined with uh the yep. under rule um but it is kind of interesting that vets collects the aap <laughs> data uh but they do it in a different format um with the eeo one job groups and so that a little different um, in terms of the detail that we would prefer to receive. Thank you. Um, with regard to the emphasis case, was there adverse impact with statistical significance in uh, hiring or was it based on gross disparity of hiring? Uh, so there was, I'm not exactly sure how they answered that. It, it, <laughs> I don't like to use the term disparate impact because it has a particular legal meaning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so there, there was certainly statistical significance, uh, but if you just look at the, the fact pattern there, um, so we would have relied on, um, you know, statistical test rather than, you know, just, uh, you know, some kind of, Four fifths impact rule. Um, so, then what was the second part of the question? Um, the question was: Was there statistical uh, significance or adverse impact, or was it based on gross disparity of hiring? Um, the conciliation agreement wasn't clear on that fact. Yeah, I'm not sure what is uh, meant by gross disparity. Um, yeah but it was a large standard deviation. I'll just say that much. Okay. Yeah, um, and, and Bob, just, just correct me, you know, for wrong, you know, and you and I have had this conversation, right, that we should, everyone should stop calling them adverse impact analyses because adverse impact is a, is a legal term of a type of discrimination, um, you know, so they were EEO disparity analyses, and I believe, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it was not an impact case, it was a disparate treatment pattern or practice case. Two different things. Yeah, I believe that's true. Thank you. Um, two more questions on the emphasis case. What could be part of the remedy uh, for whites or men? So the remedy stipulated also in the CA is that you hope that they engage in outreach and in, in, in record keeping and improve their uh, applicant flow so that it, it looks more uh, like the availability. Thank you. Uh, how did OFCCP identify Asian Indians as a separate subset of Asians? Um, as that data would not have been collected in self ID, self identification process. That's true. I don't know specifically in this case, but in others, we are able to discern that from visa data. We have uh, data on visas in country mm -hmm. of origin. So sometimes it's in the, you know, the item 19 data that we receive. Thank you. Um, Bob, I think you answered this, but are the IRCA settlements included in the OFCCP overall settlements? Uh, yes, but my figures for yes. that are over time. So those are from 2018. So that's why the, the figures are different. Okay. And do IRCAs require annual reporting for five years? 
In most cases, yes, and sometimes biannual. So for hiring um, violations, you know, a lot of times you'll have a lot of activity in a six-month period. And so we'll typically have a six-month reporting period. For compensation, that usually changes annually. So we uh, usually accept just annual reporting on compensation. Thank you. Um, focus review. There, there are some other questions, and I'm going to pick two more because we're at time. But uh, regarding focus reviews, as contractors continue to sign ERCAs, exempting many establishments, uh, what other areas will the agency focus its efforts? On what other areas? Uh, that may be related to my resource commentary. You know, there are a lot of unscheduled contractors out there for us to focus our efforts on, um, as well as outreach and, and you know, compliance assistance. Um, and then, as we mentioned, we will be looking at promotions uh, more closely. So, um, the, those are the areas uh, that are forthcoming. Um, and then another you know, enforcement update is that we really we want to start looking for intersectional discrimination and then including smaller groups in shortfalls where we can, because we do anticipate a further expansion of the percentage of people identifying as multi-race, two-race, and the like. Thank you. Funny. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, that's fine. I'm just saying there's plenty of areas for us to <laughs> investigate or to, um, you know, focus our attention that uh, may have been overlooked in the past. Thank you. Uh, final question. Will, OF, will the OFCCP definition of promotion for focused reviews flow to the goal attainment or IRAs? I can. So, Bob, let me let me just comment on that. So, so the the just quickly. So, the goal attainment report, and, and not to go into detail, but the goal attainment report covers promotions, but it's only promotions to a job group. Whereas the 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 adverse uh, the EEO analytics um, that are done are promotions from and within a job group. So, those are different types of analyses, but but they both look at promotions. Um, I think that the agency will hopefully put out guidance on first kind of separating competitive uh, from non-competitive promotions, because those are two different things. And then from there, best practices to, to analyze those, those two different practices. Thank you. Thank you, David, Patty, and Bob. Um, I also would like to thank all of the folks who were in attendance today. I'd like to thank our sponsors again. And just as a reminder, you can receive SHRM and HRCI credits for these webinars. Um, also, we, we look forward to seeing you hopefully in Nashville next year in 2020, August 1st through the 4th. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.